Uh, a note to our help desk first, you can now start recording. And then another request to all our journalists here in the session. If you want to record, please send a request to help desk via the chat option and they will, they will allow you to start recording. Um, so again, hello and welcome to our regular Thursday discussions that we dubbed EP Talks. Today's discussion is a bit different because it's more international than, than usually. Um, we have some representatives of the civil society in Western Balkans, uh, in the Western Balkans present here, um, and along with our uh, ambassador schools, the usual suspects that we love very much. Um, and and uh, the rest will be done by our uh, friend and Damira Gregory, who will moderate the session. And my colleague Marco will explain the technicalities of how you can pose your questions. Thank you, Andrea, and welcome everybody also from my side. Uh, so uh, down there in the right corner, you have option uh, chat. I can already see that some of you are uh, sending uh, greets to, to everyone, uh, but you can also choose a profile called send questions here. And that's actually the place where you can ask your questions and then our uh, moderator, Damira, will take them and uh, ask uh, our uh, speakers. So use chat uh, at any time you can send your question, just uh, write your name and school or organization you're coming from. And then uh, this profile, which is called send question here, will send uh, your questions to our uh, moderator. So that's on, on, a technical, on technicalities how to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, hearty welcome to our discussion about uh, EU disinformation uh, and the Western Balkans. Our distinguished speakers are Tonino Pizzola, Croatian member of the European Parliament and president of the EP's working group for Western Balkans. Jaume Duhgio, spokesperson and the director general for communications of the European Parliament. Participants of our discussion will also be Gordon Bosanac and the fact checker Peter Vidal. Uh, we will also hear messages from uh, Violeta Stanicic, head of the European Parliament office in Zagreb. Uh, this discussion is being recorded and will be used by the media and the EP social media. As you heard, uh, you can ask questions in chat and uh, one information that uh, this discussion is organized in partnership with Croatian platform from International Citizen Solidarity, active in the area of international development cooperation and humanitarian aid. Uh, Mr. Pizzula, another welcome to you and thank you. Uh, it's time to your expose. First of all, thank you for inviting me and uh, of course I'm glad to exchange views with all people able to watch us uh, today. Um, Let's stick to the title of our <clears throat> uh, meeting today. Uh, a lot has been said about the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has slowed down the yeah, European Union enlargement process. Well, that's not the, the whole truth. The process when 10 new members were introduced at once. It should also be from the east to the west after the fall of Berlin Wall. They they say that around 20 million people moved to the West in pursuit of jobs and a better future. After Bulgaria and Romania joined 2007, a great recession of 2008 showed that European Union architecture stops from reacting timely to crisis. Truth should be told. The mechanisms we adopted then Today, I'm not adequate to address challenges and immense problems in a timely manner. Ironically, it could be said that member states haven't uh, transferred a sufficient portion of their sovereignty to the European Union, but in turn, they blame the European Union for not being able uh, to respond adequately. Um, on the other side, the empowerment of the European Parliament uh, has partly uh, curbed European Union democratic uh, deficit, operating the path to strengthening European Union 
uh, crisis management capacities. Uh, the aftermath of the Great Recession plus migrants, influx and finally Brexit left the European Union somewhat uh, dumbfounded. Still, there is a room for cautious optimism. In spite of the pandemic, European Union's earlier institutional fatigue and some member states' exploitation of enlargement fears, the European Union enlargement policy is alive, but not much kicking. But it's for sure that the European Union enlargement policy is, in fact, its most effective foreign and security policy instrument. It has till now repeatedly proven itself to be a stabilizing factor for our neighbors, uh, helped spread European Union influence, and let's not forget the spreading of the common market and brought um, affluence to all new member state citizens. Enlargement in the Western Balkans, which I deeply believe in, will bring multiple benefits. Firstly, it will help Union regain credibility, lost uh, by not being consequent in its actions towards the region and potential membership candidates. Secondly, it will prove that the European Union is able to gain and hold ground in its closest neighborhood, which it historically and economically intertwines with. Um, that it is able to implement common foreign and security policies in the multipolar, even more complex and uncertain world. Third, and perhaps most important, it will be able to prove to its citizens that it has the capacities um, to handle 21st century challenges as successfully as it has in the second half of the 20th century. And this will demand that the process of European Union internal consolidations goes on parallel to the enlargement process. The EU has the capacities, but it requires more uh, political will. After last autumn's blockade, Albania, Northern Macedonia have in March been given a green light to start the uh, negotiation process um, a month prior. February, the Commission introduced a new negotiation methodology containing uh, many welcomed innovations. However, in recommendations I presented in April in, in the European Parliament, we proposed also many worthwhile improvements. To sum up, the European Union has secured 3.3 billion euro to aid Western Balkans in the fight against the pandemic and for recovery afterwards. This proven European Union is aware of importance of its neighborhood and uh, our core dependence. In the region, except for Serbia, it has been widely welcomed as a sign of not being left alone to tackle this crisis. It's a both a human and a smart decision by the European Union. And the Zagreb summit gave us declaration with no explicit mention of the enlargement process but uh, reconfirming Western Balkans European perspective. Uh, looking back to the first Zagreb summit in 2000, there is obvious lack of enthusiasm and Europeanism we felt back then and we need to admit that. However, it's a good that process is still ongoing. And for final, I would like to say that European Union won't be a finished project until it encompasses all of Western Balkans. The same goes for Croatia, integration into the European Union. It won't be final until we have member states on all our borders. That's for introductory. Yes, what about impact of uh, COVID-19 of the EU enlargement process? I would like to say there is no successful, successful <clears throat> EU strategy for combating uh, coronavirus if it, the Western Balkans is not included. Uh, both because of the geopolitical position of the Western Balkans uh, between European Union member states and the political message that the European Union sends to them uh, about future integration. Um, the European Union must not leave Western Balkans countries alone to cope uh, with uh, this extraordinary human and economic crisis caused by the virus. Um, the first proof of solidarity would be to help them to ensure that their health systems 
are better equipped and to contain and treat the disease. And they're often considerably underfunded, weak and lacking, lacking uh, medical personnel who mostly emigrated. Um, and despite current extraordinary circumstances, the enlargement process should continue with the ex enhanced uh, pace put in place this year thanks to the new accession approach. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucia from Kirk uh, uh, asks you, what uh, negative impacts on Croatia can have not joining of European neighborhood countries to the EU? Many of them. I would like to uh, reiterate that as a Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, asking about chances of our neighborhood to come closer to European Union membership, I said full benefits of being a member of the European Union, Croatia will feel them on each and every centimeter on our borders, we will share the borders with another European Union member states. The reasons uh, uh, and motives for Croatia are numerous. First of all, uh, we need to uh, keep uh, our economical uh, cooperations because uh, let's be face Croatian industry and of course services, um, they are exporting uh, commodities, good services uh, in a great deal uh, to our uh, uh, neighborhood from the south and, and the east. Another reason that uh, we need to uh, uh, foster our relations is security reasons. We are sharing many common uh, security uh, threats, uh, so it's much better if you do it in, as collective uh, than do it individually. So I think that is a, a number of the reasons why I need to, uh, as a country, uh, push uh, our neighbors and motivate our neighbors to be as soon as members of European Union. But let's be realistic. Uh, it takes at least uh, two for tango, in this case even more. And uh, our neighbors also need to fulfill uh, certain requirements, uh, adopt certain standards. Uh, what is not easy in, in the couple of the years last, we are all witnessing um, certain backslides in that area. To be honest, uh, you already mentioned the Zagreb Declaration. Uh, in your opinion, the next steps in the ne negotiation process with North uh, Macedonia and Albania, to be realistic? Yeah, I would like to be realistic. First of all, it's a good that the um, European Council finally uh, gave a green light to both countries to start negotiation process but in a way European Council didn't uh, its job um, uh, completely because it did not give a mandate European Commission to uh, do a negotiation framework uh, what is necessary for negotiation to start and in this moment we don't see uh, any time frame for doing so on the other hand, um, we got caretaking government in Northern Macedonia and uh, elections uh, are envisaged and I do hope that it will take place in the, in the immediate future, maybe before the end of this year, in order for Macedonia at least to start negotiations. Albania is a little um, uh, complex problem in this moment because if you remember European Council so put some additional um, uh, conditionality before Tirana in order to uh, become a, a country uh, which will negotiate or to become a candidate country in the area of the fighting of organized crime and, uh, um, and uh, combating the corruptions. In this, uh, within this time and horizon line, uh, I don't see that both countries will start uh, uh, negotiations uh, um, I don't think it, it can happen during the German uh, chairmanship. Next year? Yes, most probably. I think that they can't uh, keep them on hold forever and in the case in the, uh, in, in the case of Albania, Albania yes. not Macedonia, uh, do their of course uh, in a way homeworks. Mm -hmm. I think next year during the Slovenia um, chairing over the European Council it might happen. We have a, another question from our audience. Uh, in what uh, respect, uh, how, wait a second, uh, is there any differences between policy and liberties in the Western EU and the West Balkan? Liberties and? 
liberties and policy differences between the view of uh, Western EU countries and the other hand, West Balkan. Liberties. I think that uh, the same uh, uh, rules must be applied to every, every, every country, every state. And if I can uh, decode the, the question uh, correctly, uh, we can also see uh, a certain backsliding uh, within the European Union. Some uh, member states' countries uh, are uh, under the scrutiny from the Brussels because uh, the judiciary uh, are assessed as uh, worrying, worrying some. Um, it's a question of how judiciary is independent uh, in, uh, in the two countries, at least in, in the European Union, Poland and Hungary, namely. And uh, what's about the media freedom, especially in the in the Hungary, of course, uh, it's been a, a lot of questions about last uh, uh, law uh, uh, granted in, uh, in uh, Budapest, which uh, gave Prime Minister uh, un, uh, a great power to use during the uh, pandemics uh, without uh, scrutiny and over, uh, over visages from the Parliament. Uh, so if you want to be, uh, how to say, reliable and credible, I think uh, we must not preach Western Balkans country and asking them to do something which is not completely applicable within the European Union. So there is no reason to, uh, to run such uh, two-sided policy. And now we have a question from Branka Vladimir. Uh, she would like to know uh, what is your impression or opinion, uh, what is general differences between uh, the period when Croatia process of joining the EU, how is that different from today's, from uh, the Balkan, Western Balkan countries today? It's a very good question, of course I've been asked that question many times before and um, my popular answer to that uh, question is, it seems that it uh, was much easier to establish European Economic Community in uh, 1957 than to join European Union in the 21st century because the uh, European project uh, had started as a community of the six countries, of course, uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, control over the two materials necessary to wage the war. And we all know uh, it was, uh, it were, there were uh, coal and steel. But what countries, candidate countries, uh, have to do today to become members of European Union is much, much complex job to do. And we are talking about the countries which uh, are, um, uh, we got mostly uh, weak economies, we, they got no uh, tradition of liberal democracy. So for them is absolutely uh, tough to uh, meet the necessary criteria. Oh, when we talk about Croatia, it's very interesting because Croatia is the only country after Greece which joined Europe in uh, community uh, early 80s, which stepped in alone uh, out of any negotiation package. Uh, um, it was much easier if you are negotiating as a group, like it uh, happened the uh, Big Bang approach and enlargement in 2004. So for today, yeah, it, it's much more uh, difficult to become a candidate country and then, of course, overcome a, a number of the hurdles during the tough and uh, long negotiations, the 45 chapters, and they become member of Europe. And it will be tough in the future. Uh, yes, because enlargement is still so not desirable word. That's why I suppose that, that was the question, but it's not impossible still. No, of course it's not impossible, but let's be let's be frank. It's uh, almost four-letter word <laughs> for many European politicians when you mention enlargement. Uh, I uh, become completely aware of that fact uh, six, seven years ago when I uh, ran for the seat for the first time in European Parliament, and then I checked uh, every election manifestos of every relevant political uh, group uh, represented in European Parliament. And then, of course, uh, I was surprised, even in the Socialists and Democrats, my group, <laughs> they did not mention a word enlargement whatsoever. I checked a hundred of the pages. So in that moment, 
of course, uh, it's obvious. It was obvious that enlargement is not winning card. Uh, that European Union needs to pass through the um, period of examining itself and to give a proper answer to its own citizens. So, Mr. President of France, Mr. Macron, just uh, spelled it loudly that the European Union uh, needs to improve uh, its own uh, functioning uh, with 27 member states, and it's hard to imagine how it be more functional with the third group, for example. We have, yes, we have a question whether the countries of the Western Balkans are economically ready for the EU. No, they are in Croatia got a, a number of the problems to meet the criteria uh, within the tough uh, single market of the European Union. But uh, how to say um, and find a proper expression, what is really worthy within, for example, Croatian economy, economy and small, medium sized companies, uh, they found uh, relatively easily its uh, market niche and Croatian uh, export uh, rose uh, in the last couple. Uh, uh, years uh, tremendously, but uh, I read somewhere that only 20 percentage of uh, overall number of Croatian com companies are able to export, what is a pretty low uh, ratio uh, if you're analyzing the economy. So it is tough and it will be tough for the uh, Western Balkans economies to prepare themselves for, to be compete and to, 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 to uh, 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 let's say, overcome problems in the single market. Just uh, one piece of information, uh, all uh, six Western Balkans in com uh, economies combined, it's only 2.5 percentage of the European Union 27 GDP, only two and a half uh, percent. And uh, <clears> the <throat> uh, income of uh, 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 and the GDP combined of uh, six uh, Western Balkans countries, uh, is equal of Mercedes-Benz profit in one year. So that numbers speaks for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Pizzola. We will come back to you. Uh, now we will hear perspective on this topic from uh, Gordon Bosanac uh, from Croatia Platform from International Citizen uh, Solidarity. It's time for your short expose. Thank you very much, Damira, and hello to everyone. I will be very short to talk maybe what happened also yesterday and day before yesterday in Croatia around the Western Balkan Summit, because uh, we also managed to mobilize the, I would say, leading uh, watchdog civil society groups from Western Balkans and from European Union, who also sent one declaration to the public with a very uh, exciting title, which is with or without you, with or without EU. Meaning not that you know the the, the most um, progressive NGOs across Europe and Western Balkans start, are starting to be against the European Union, but for sure they started to ask very serious question: Is it EU today this kind of organization that can bring democracy, rule of law uh, to the Western Balkans region? Uh, and uh, it was challenged this idea that uh, you know the EU will stabilize the Western Balkan uh, region uh, in the future. I like to say, you know, that the, the, the organization that, the sta that signed the declaration, you know, they are, those are the strongest uh, civil society organizations who are on the front line of fighting for the rule of law, for the human rights. Those are the people who organize Sarajevo Pride. Those are the people who are fighting corrupted politicians uh, across the Western Balkans and in EU. So when EU get that kind of the message from, from the people who are, should be the, their first collaborators, that raise some questions to what extent EU is uh, capable to stabilize the Western Balkans. Just if we put ourselves in the position of, uh, you know, uh, citizen of the Northern Macedonia, which is very, very much aware that uh, their former prime minister today enjoys the protection of one of EU member states, which is Hungary, and he escaped from the Northern Macedonia and he was use, misusing the secret service, services to spy on opposition. Those are all the questions, what can be, the, be done today to protect fundamental European values, but maybe without the framework of institution. And the question we've been raising on our shadow summit was what can we, what can we, we do together? NGOs from you know, EU, outside of the EU, but ordinary people who are protecting the values of European values, is that possible to protect it uh, without the framework maybe of EU? Because people cannot anymore wait. 
And just to put one more sentence in the context uh, of this disinformation, I think it is very uh, important to understand who are those anti-democratic forces which are hitting not only the Western Balkans, which are now attacking and working within EU, and uh, reading all this uh, tremendous amount of disinformation around COVID, uh, even uh, the, the, the summit, it will be really important to understand who is standing behind them. You know, sometimes we are thinking it's like the big players, political forces, big states, but maybe there's some extreme right-wing groups, I don't know, and it will be really good to hear from our fact-checkers who are today with us, because they are doing tremendous job nowadays. I'm amazed with the amount of the trash news which are circling around and fact checkers are really trying to deconstruct those lies. It will be good also for, to hear from them. Do they have any information who is actually standing behind this tremendous amount of on this information? Thanks a lot. Uh, of course, we will ask that questions. And uh, now we will go to the Violeta Stanicic, head of the European Parliament Office in Croatia. Hi. Yes. Hello. One more time, uh, hello to everybody and welcome. As far as I see, we have over 180 people in the room following this event. Allow me to one more time uh, give our uh, thanks, uh, our profound gratitude to Mr. Pizzula, who is uh, participating, I think, for a second or third time in this now regular weekly EP talks we are organizing. And immediately to introduce you and to move to the next speaker who is uh, the spokesman of the European Parliament and the Director General of uh, the Directorate of Communication of our institution, Jean Medrduc, who is probably already has joined us. Just a few words for him. He has uh, the unique role of combining these two heads, being the person who in general talks to the, normally to Brussels based, but to all European media on all issues relating to the European Parliament. He's also, of course, the leader of uh, General Director of Communication since 2017. And he's been in charge of the very um, intensive, energetic uh, election campaign, which we had last year, which led to unprecedented, very high participation of European citizens in the elections for the European Parliament with over 50%. At that time, of course, it seemed that uh, with uh, their direct participation in European democracy, citizens are showing a very strong <coughs> signal of uh, support to the European project. I suppose we are now going to talk whether disinformation can actually undermine, dig under, under the pillars of this project. One more time, allow me to say Thank you so much to our Director General for agreeing to participate in this event, especially for the region and for Croatia, and to welcome him to our talks. Thank you very much, uh, Violeta. Uh, I hope that you can see me and that you can also hear me uh, as loud as necessary. If not, please uh, let me know. Uh, I'm uh, really glad to participate in this, uh, this uh, seminar, this uh, webinar about uh, European Union, disinformation on the Balkans, the Western Balkans. Of course, I'm not, ex I'm not an expert on Western Balkans, don't uh, expect from me any interesting insight on that, but I'll, I'll do my best uh, at least uh, for everything which is uh, linked to disinformation and how disinformation uh, affects, as you just uh, said now, uh, Violetta, uh, the work and the image of the European Union in normal times and also uh, in a very specific way now uh, during this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis with the outbreak. I don't know how you would like to organize this uh, meeting. Would you like me answering questions? Would you like uh, a kind of uh, uh, introduction? I, I'm of course well, no. uh, open to, to every uh, possible uh, way of uh, organizing our time together. I would like to thank, tell you thank you also and uh, welcome. It's very nice to see you. And we will also have questions from our, our audience, but we can start with this topic. Uh, this information is always a giant problem, especially uh, now in times of COVID-19. So uh, why does the EU worry so much about this information at the moment? Because this information, it's never a neutral thing. Uh, this information comes with a purpose. Uh, uh, this information, first of, first of all, has an origin, and this origin, uh, most of times, is not just 
a casual one. And, and then, of course, uh, it's always linked with uh, a strategy. Uh, in normal times, uh, as I just uh, said, this information can be uh, very harming uh, because uh, it will probably uh, be linked to political campaigns. It will be linked most of times to uh, extreme ideologies at the extreme right side or at the left or right side. Sometimes it will be linked also to external interferences. Uh, most of times uh, tries to harm democracy, tries to harm values, tries to harm also the, uh, the trust of citizens in the institutions. And if uh, you are uh, good in doing that, if you really succeed, in creating this distrust or in creating uh, this uh, bad relationship between citizens and the institutions, the democratic institutions, then you are weakening everything. You are weakening democracy, you are uh, weakening uh, uh, the rule uh, of law. But uh, I would say uh, this is what happens in normal times. Now it's even worse because now we are uh, in a situation where this information can kill it's not just as that it can kill people, uh, sorry, it can kill democracy, it's also that it can kill uh, people, uh, citizens, because we are seeing now, and maybe we can develop with, uh, with other questions, or questions coming from, from uh, those who are participating in the, in the seminar, and thanks for being there, that uh, it's uh, a huge part of the disinformation campaign now, are uh, linked to health, are linked to the way uh, to cope or not to cope with the pandemic. And this is, I would say, a new, because of course, in the history of humanity, in other cases, there were always strange theories about how to heal people, about how to treat a, a illness, about how to react to, uh, to severe situations. But now this is amplified by the social media and this is amplified by the fact that against, behind these campaigns, there's always uh, someone who comes uh, with uh, very clear targets, with very clear objectives. What has uh, the EU done to tackle this information during this uh, COVID-19 outbreak? Well, uh, I would say uh, uh, many things. Uh, in some way, uh, first of all, uh, th that those things that we are doing uh, uh, since uh, a couple of years, because as I said, this information is not new. By the way, this information has always been, in some way, linked to the history of the European Union since the beginning, since the 50s, the 60s. Uh, you could see in some uh, countries how media were uh, misinforming about what the European Union at that time, the European community was doing or was uh, uh, not uh, uh, doing. You can, of course, see also uh, during these last 20, 30 years, how disinformation in Britain, for example, prepared the field uh, to what happened at some point two years ago, three years ago uh, with uh, the Brexit. So this information is not new and the way of uh, treating uh, or attacking this information is not new, uh, at least not for the European Parliament. Uh, it means, first of all, that you have to coordinate with other institutions. This is not, this is not something that you can do alone. You have to uh, ask for the help of the uh, European Commission, uh, the European Action Service, which is quite uh, good, very good in identifying uh, external threats and, uh, and disinformation campaigns coming from, from third countries and not uh, from uh, uh, the, the inside uh, uh, borders of uh, uh, the European Union. It's also about uh, making a lot of pedagogy to try to explain to the citizens what is this information, what is qualitative information, to try to help them to identify, to make the difference among them, uh, to, uh, to promote also the need of uh, trusting experts, because that's also something quite interesting this last time, how and some people tend uh, to, uh, uh, to accept uh, ideas, recommendations, advice coming from friends or from family or someone who was uh, uh, on a show on TV uh, with, uh, without asking for, for proofs. And then when the experts arrive, uh, they say, yeah, but uh, I don't trust these uh, people. I don't understand what are uh, saying. I'm sure that there is something behind what they are uh, telling uh, uh, to me. 
it's also about being transparent. I think that when, when the institutions uh, can really show to the citizens that there is nothing to be hidden, that the information uh, is uh, uh, sure that uh, we uh, are uh, really uh, dynamic in, in spreading the information we get. This also uh, can help. Uh, and then I think that there is a role to be played, probably even more important than from the institutions, a role uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, um, the fact checkers. And there, the only thing that we can do, it's important, but it's the only thing that we can do, is to support their task, to be sure that they have the means to do that, uh, to be sure that they can connect uh, among each other, fact checkers in Croatia, yes, but also uh, in cooperation with uh, fact checkers in other countries within the union or in other uh, countries, also third countries not belonging to the union. Because when you coordinate fact checkers, when they are able to share information and to share data and to share their findings, of course, uh, this uh, work uh, uh, becomes much more, uh, much more important. And then, uh, sorry for being a little bit long, uh, something which is also uh, key uh, for fighting against this information is to uh, get help from the, the big platforms, uh, being Facebook, Microsoft, Google, YouTube, or others. Because of course, these are in many cases the ways uh, that are uh, used, the channels which are used by uh, those people who would like uh, to circulate this information. And these platforms has the duty, the moral duty, and at some point also the legal duty uh, to prevent uh, being uh, used uh, for, for these uh, misinformation uh, activities. Of course, but does the EU cooperate with online platforms to encourage them in promoting authoritative sources? Yes, of course. This is something which we took quite seriously since a, a couple of years. There was a huge discussion, by the way, in the European Parliament until the Parliament took a position, official position on this. Uh, uh, because there were, in some way, two sides. Uh, there were those who thought that uh, the best way uh, to cope with the platforms uh, would be to adopt uh, European legislation obliging them to do s certain things uh, to protect the people against this information and to find them in case this uh, uh, wouldn't happen. And those who thought that this may be wouldn't be necessary and that it would be preferable uh, to, uh, to reach uh, memoranda of understanding and to reach uh, gentlemen uh, agreements with these platforms uh, in a, let's say, in a fair, open uh, way uh, as a first step. And then at some point, uh, some point to evaluate the result of this, this strategy. And uh, in case of, uh, uh, mm, in case of a situation where it would be uh, obvious that it doesn't work or it doesn't work uh, uh, well enough, then to pass to a kind of second step and to put into place uh, legislation. At the end, there was a majority both in the European Commission and uh, in uh, the European Parliament uh, to adopt this kind of two steps strategy to try to do these things first in good cooperation with the platforms. And if it doesn't work, then uh, to go uh, for something, uh, let's say, uh, uh, much more uh, uh, tough uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, duty. I would like to know, what is your opinion? Uh, what is the main aim uh, of some false claims, especially those uh, regarding the EU? Well, uh, when it, uh, there are many, and now with COVID-19, I would say we could uh, uh, publish a book with maybe uh, 100 of them, uh, some of them very, very dangerous, uh, others, uh, I wouldn't say funny, but so original that uh, uh, you really cannot understand how people could uh, think that these uh, that these uh, 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 theories uh, can be can be right and can be uh, true. Uh, from the side of the European Union, or uh, on those things which affect the European Union, I think that uh, and the the narratives, the storytellings uh, are more or less always the same. The first is that. Uh, the European Union is completely uh, useless, that uh, we are not coping with COVID-19, that uh, we are not prepared to do that, that we are not taking the measures to be taken, 
and that it would be much uh, better uh, to uh, go back to a situation where each country has absolute independence, no coordination with other countries, and each one tries to find the solution uh, competing uh, with uh, others. The second is that uh, we are not a democracy, that uh, uh, we are in fact a kind of new Soviet Union or something like that, where Brussels is dictating everything and then the member states have to uh, simply obey and to accept uh, these decisions. Of course, at some point, these narratives are even uh, 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 impossible to put uh, together because you cannot say from one side that the European Union has no powers, is doing nothing, it's completely useless and it's inefficient. And then uh, one minute later saying, yeah, but the European Union is deciding everything and the European Union uh, has too uh, many powers and the European Union is preventing uh, the member states to do what they uh, should uh, do. I think these are probably the most important. But as I said uh, at the beginning of this, uh, this talk, uh, now, of course, the, the novelty or the new element is that we are seeing also all these uh, uh, fake theories uh, linked to health, linked uh, to the way uh, of coping with, uh, with uh, COVID-19, with coronavirus. And these are even worse because these could affect and are affecting uh, the health of uh, the European citizens. Gordon Bostanas mentioned that uh, in the beginning, but what is your impression? Uh, are we talking about uh, individuals that are spreading those uh, false claims or is something much more than that? I think it's much more than individuals. Of course, there are maybe individuals who are helping because they trust what they are uh, uh, getting as information or simply because they think that it's uh, uh, interesting to, to, to spread, to, uh, uh, to send uh, this disinformation to other people. Sometimes maybe because they simply don't know that this is disinformation. That's also the worrying thing here, that there are many, many citizens who uh, are full of uh, a good willingness, but who are helping uh, to spread this misinformation because they are not able to make the distinction between a good uh, information and misinformation. But it's obvious that there is something uh, behind this and that most of this misinformation is, is guided and is organized. And uh, as, I, uh, as the, the, the member of the European Parliament just said, Probably there, uh, there are several uh, factors and there are several subjects. Uh, I mean, when you read uh, uh, the, uh, the information, the documents which come from the European External Action Service, it's uh, what they call the STRATCOM unit, which is the unit in charge of fighting against this information. The data are there and the facts are there. There are campaigns which come from Russia. There are, there are campaigns which come from China. It doesn't mean that it comes uh, right from the governments or from the governmental sphere. This can be broader than that. And then there are campaigns which are in some way the echo of these campaigns, which are more national and which are most of times promoted by those uh, political parties or by those uh, political entities or ideological organizations. Uh, which are in some way uh, helping uh, these, uh, these external actors and which uh, share more or less the same ideology that they are trying to promote. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we have one question from audience. Uh, can we make a law in whole European Union to stop fake news and to penalize authors of fake news financially? Well, this is part of the discussion that I just mentioned about the possibility of having a law which uh, simply would say, okay, uh, fake news uh, are forbidden, but uh, it's not as simple as it could uh, uh, look like. I mean, uh, there is one case, uh, France adopted a law against misinformation uh, recently. So probably the most interesting thing in maybe half a year or in one year is to assess the situation in France and to see how this law has affected positively or negatively the situation. But uh, first of all, France is not an isolated country. It's not because you are forbidding something in France that misinformation is not going to come from other countries, uh, even in French, not only in English or in other languages. And then of course, it's not just because you are forbidding something that this thing is not going to, to happen. Uh, in social media, uh, many of the actors are completely anonymous. So 
uh, uh, it would be really rather difficult to try to go to find to sanction them because of this or because of that. So that's why uh, the institutions, the European institutions, uh, decided to take this, uh, as I said, this two steps approach. First, let's uh, really convince uh, these big internet platforms that they are those who should be the first concerned about being uh, uh, misused by these people or these organizations which are spreading misinformation. Why? Because it's also about credibility. And one, two years ago, at some point, uh, there was in the European Union, in many countries, the feeling that uh, Facebook was not helping democracy, that Facebook was in some way uh, too, uh, let's say, too open uh, to every kind of uh, fake news and that this was being used to uh, 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 to, to weaken uh, democracy in uh, many countries, and it was linked uh, to the uh, 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 to the Brexit campaign. It was linked to the presidential elections in France. It was also linked to uh, the last presidential elections in the United States. And I think that all these things, at some point, uh, also pushed uh, Facebook and other platforms. It's not just about uh, Facebook to take really seriously uh, their role uh, in fighting against misinformation. But again, if at some point we see that this is not enough and that we need also uh, to adopt our legislation, legislation which then uh, would enter into force in all the member states of the, of the European Union, it will be done. And I'm sure that the European Parliament is going to take this uh, topic quite seriously in the next weeks and months. Uh, there is now a decision to create a specific uh, committee about uh, disinformation, and I expect we uh, should expect from this committee a, a very uh, politically important report and probably a, a long list of measures to be taken at different levels, being European or national. Thank you. Now we have another question from uh, Gordon Bosanat. Are some disinformation coming from inside Europe, working independently from Russia and China, but wanting to work against democracy values due to their particular radical interests? Yes, of course. Uh, and there are many examples of this. Uh, maybe one of them uh, is uh, Italy. During the last uh, two, three years, uh, around the last uh, uh, national elections in Italy, but also around the European elections uh, in Italy last year, there have been a lot uh, of uh, uh, fake news circulating and some disinformation campaigns, uh, which were uh, fully national, uh, which uh, were pushed by Italians, by people living uh, in Italy, sometimes connected uh, with uh, external sources, sometimes uh, uh, simply inspiring themselves from these external sources or saying more or less uh, the same uh, things. You could see more or less the same also in the last months in Spain, probably also in other countries, of course in, uh, in, in your country and in other countries in, in, in Central uh, in, and Eastern Europe. All the countries of the European Union in different ways uh, are affected by this uh, situation. And yes, I think that it's absolutely true and it's easy to, to, uh, to prove it that there are these external and internal uh, uh, sources uh, of this information in some, uh, in, let's say, in some occasions and for some stories, narratives are perfectly linked. Uh, in others, they are just working in parallel. Thank you. Uh, now we have another question. Uh, wait a second, uh, uh, it's critical opinion, I will say. Uh, you said that uh, false informations aren't a new thing, but uh, shouldn't they, shouldn't you, find a new way of coping with them, considering that uh, this information during COVID-19 outbreak uh, could actually really harm big groups of people? Yes, it's true, and this is why we are all uh, doing uh, uh, quite a huge effort against all these uh, theories which are harming health. Uh, it's uh, about what the member states are doing. It's uh, about all these information campaigns which have been coordinated among the member states, but also with European institutions. It's about the websites published by the three institutions, the Council, the Commission, the European Parliament, which are also linked with all the national websites in the member states. We are 
all working in the same line and we are all sending the same messages. We are all uh, supporting the measures taken at the European and at the national level. We are all telling people since the first day, you have to keep social distance, you have to wash your hands, you have to do this, you shouldn't do uh, that, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, um, accept uh, uh, strange theories, you have to trust uh, scientifics, you have to trust the experts, you shouldn't trust the people who are uh, simply there uh, uh, speaking loudly but with uh, no background behind. This we are doing, I would say, uh, in a way which is not our normal way of working in some way. I would say we, for example, in the communication services of the European Parliament, we stop uh, many activities which were linked to uh, what happens in this house about legislation, about the resolutions adopted by the parliament, to focus all our energies, to focus our means, to open our channels uh, to this civic information. And for many weeks, we were helping still today. We were helping uh, to the member states, to the governments, to the, uh, 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 to the World uh, Health Organization to convince people about how to cope uh, 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 with uh, COVID-19 and of course at the same time uh, fighting about uh, all uh, this misinformation uh, on how uh, to treat, uh, the, I mean which kind of treatments could be uh, really uh, useful uh, uh, against COVID-19, about those who say that this virus was not dangerous, those who said that it's not necessary to stay at home, that the lockdown is completely silly because uh, in fact the disinfection is not serious enough. Uh, those who say that we don't need a vaccine, which by the way are the same who say that we don't need a vaccine for uh, any, uh, anything, uh, uh, anything at all. Uh, all these uh, things have to be uh, uh, combated, have to be uh, uh, fought against. And that's what the parliament is doing too. Yes, we have those examples, for example, in the national parliaments, but this, that is another topic. But one question, some of the fake narratives are done with a lot of humor, and it's, it can feel quite good to laugh in uh, times of crisis like this. Is there much harm in uh, sharing them? Can we make that uh, difference between that kind of messages? It, it's also fake news, of course. There are many kinds of fake news and all of them are dangerous. I mean, for example, uh, those fake news where someone pretends to be an expert. We all have received uh, in our private channels, WhatsApp or Telegram or others, for example, sound files with someone explaining to us in a very expert way uh, what to do, uh, how to take into consideration these or other elements. And then some days, some days later, there is someone who informs you that this was a fake doctor or a fake scientist or a fake expert. It's true, there are others which are just uh, using humor, which are using memes, which are using materials which are very easy to spread because people, of course, like to laugh and people who are stuck at home for weeks and weeks, they are, I mean, they all have a lot of time to consult uh, social media and to share this uh, kind of content and there are also fake news which are quite emotional there are uh, fake news where in fact the way to convince people to spread them is that uh, they call to your heart they call not to your brain they call to your sentiments to your feelings and these are probably uh, the more uh, the more difficult to counter because uh, when you are confronted to emotions, it's very difficult to try to solve this with uh, simply rational elements you also to you have also to try to be emotional, but uh, sometimes the truth is not emotional. Truth can even be very, but the truth is the truth and fake news are fake news. Of course, uh, we have another question. Do you think those uh, types of laws against fake news could eventually be used as tools for system of corruption? For example, uh, corruptive governments uh, or people in places of power using them for their own gain or controlling media outputs? It could happen, of course, and I think that this is maybe uh, one of the reasons why if at some point uh, this kind of legislation should exist, it should be at the European level and not at the national level. Of course, then 
this legislation has to be applied also at the national level and in some cases also to be developed uh, uh, through uh, national laws adopted by uh, the national parliament. But if there is a legal European uh, framework which is really uh, explaining what must be adopted and where are the red lines to be respected, then probably I don't say that this danger will disappear, but uh, it will be really reduced. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, of course, stay tuned, but uh, I suppose that we have a uh, fact checker, Peter Vido, with us. Is he here? Can we hear him? Hello, I'm here. Hello. Well, uh, we had problems with fake, fake uh, news or false claims in Croatia and Western Balkans before pandemic. What is now, in your opinion, the biggest problem in that field? Uh, I believe that right now the, the, the biggest problem that we are facing in the dis disinformation sphere uh, is the, uh, the, 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 the movement of people who are, who, who are opposing all kinds of vaccines. And that is something that we are seeing a lot of these past days since the start of the pandemic and, and the, the proportions of this uh, are quite troublesome. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the very start of the, 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 the epidemic in Croatia, uh, the mo most fake, fake, uh, fake news, most disinformation uh, was actually focused on the things like false cures or negating the seriousness of the virus. There, was a, there were also uh, 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 disinformation about geopolitical uh, 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 rivalry, rivalries claiming that US created the virus or that China created the virus and things like that. But for the past weeks actually mo 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 most of this disinformation that we are seeing is related to vaccines uh, whether it's about the process of creating a, a COVID-19 vaccines or uh, whether it's claiming that uh, other types of types of vaccines have been proven extremely harmful uh, to, 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 to for human patients so uh, obviously all, all, all these claims these, these claims are false they are not, not based on factual uh, evidence they are not not based on scientific findings but but the, uh, the, the, the idea here is to create a mass movement against vaccines and, and use the, 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 the pa pandemic uh, basically as an, as an excuse to spread the, these false beliefs among the, the citizens. Mm -hmm. When we compare this situation with normal, to, if you can say normal situation before, fake news is something that is always, always uh, some kind of dangerous. But uh, now, do you think it's about individuals or it's also something much uh, more dangerous, big uh, plan, something like that? Well, uh, it's uh, so you, you, th there are two types of disinformation that you can see out there. The first type is the the the, the is the kind of disinformation that was uh, made by somebody for a political goal, whether they're a political actor or an act actor or an interest interest group or something like that. They create this disinformation. But this is basically propaganda to achieve th their goals. Uh, the, uh, these are uh, the, uh, the, these people, pro propagandists, who want to, to, to use this information to, to make some kind of a profit for themselves and political gain for themselves, are probably in the minority. Uh, the, the majority of the disinformation space uh, consists of people who are trying to monetize the so-called fake news, who are trying to earn money on them, because uh, because the, 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 this disinformation usually, usually is aimed uh, to, to be very emotionally, uh, uh, to, very emotional for people who read it, so it attracts a lot of clicks and it enables people who produce them to earn money via Google Ads, for example. So uh, the, 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 uh, the most, of, most people who actually spread this information are trying to monetize, uh, monetize it, to earn money from it. Uh, but they are usually inspired by the propagandists. So basically, a propagandist creates a piece of disinformation and lets it out there, and then all the people who want to make money off of this information just copy it onto their websites and amplify it and spread it further. We are t talking about uh, serious money, or? Uh, well, uh, depends on what, 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 what you find to be serious. For example, there, were, there, there, there was a, a, a famous case, there were famous cases of so-called troll farms in Macedonia, which produced fake news ahead of the uh, US uh, presidential election back in 2016. And people from Macedonia who were de doing this, they, they, some of them, uh, uh, some of them gave, gave interviews, stepped out publicly to say that they're actually doing this for money because they can earn as much as uh, a couple of thousand dollars per week doing this, which is obviously a lot of money when you're living in Macedonia. Somewhere else, it's maybe it's, it, it, it's not so profitable. 
Is it now, uh, can you now compare situation considering the fact of COVID-19 and situation before? Is it now, uh, you can see the race of fake news? Yes, uh, so be uh, before you, you had this information, I mean, but it wasn't on a scale like this. Uh, right now, the circumstances are new. The world is the, the world has has changed quite a bit in just a few weeks, and a lot of people are ha are having a hard time dealing with these new circumstances. So they they are trying to make sense of it. They are trying to find information that uh, that will enable them to explain what is going on around them. And uh, th this information providers are seeing this, and they have started to work work over time. So there is uh, my, the, the 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 sheer volume of of this information uh, out there is uh, a lot bigger than it was before. Can you tell me what, uh, if you have that impression, what is characterized for these Western Balkans? What is the most dominant fa fake news in this period of time? Um, in the in this period of time, I, I do believe it to be the the, the 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 most dominant conspiracy theory out there is that Bill Gates is behind the pandemic because he wants to vaccinate everyone and implant microchips into us. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, now we go to the uh, Mr. Dugio. If you're still here, thanks uh, a lot for everything. Uh, now you can say something for some kind of conclusion. Yeah, well, first of all, it was very interesting what uh, uh, this uh, uh, fact checker just uh, shared with uh, us. And uh, thanks for, for, for the information. This confirms uh, the, the trends that uh, uh, we uh, were identifying uh, from, from Brussels, but of course with the national and the local uh, aspect. No, I, I would just say that uh, we have to be uh, absolutely convinced that uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, it's, not also, it's not only a health crisis, it's also a kind of infodemic or a disinfo pandemic, and both are very dangerous. Of course, uh, we are, I would say, confronted in different ways when someone is uh, uh, ill, uh, when someone in our families, hopefully not, or in our friends' uh, circles die or is at hospital because of this uh, pandemic, we focus on this. But uh, there is also all this disinformation which is doing a uh, quite serious, uh, horrible work, both in terms of protecting, or in this case, attempting against uh, people's health and attempting against democracy. And once this uh, crisis will be over, I mean, the health crisis will be over, hopefully uh, quite soon. We will still be confronted uh, to the consequences uh, of this other uh, pandemic, which is this, this info or this uh, info uh, pandemic. And there we have to be uh, really uh, very, very careful because if uh, the result of this is that we are weakening uh, democracy, if the result of this is that we are uh, weakening values, uh, human rights, if the result of this is that uh, there is an increasing number of people who think that, uh, uh, that the Chinese model or the Russian model are better just because their propaganda try to convince us or convinced us that they uh, uh, were better than we uh, were in fighting against COVID-19. And then this will come with uh, an impact, which will be not just an economic impact, it will also be a moral impact, it will be a civic impact. And then uh, we will uh, discover that we, have, uh, uh, we enter into uh, a politically uh, tricky and difficult situation. So we have to be very sure that we all, uh, the institutions at the European level, at the national level, at the political parties, at least those who take quite seriously uh, the fact that they are there to represent citizens and to uh, and to uh, uh, raise uh, uh, the uh, the welfare of uh, those citizens they are representing, the fact checkers, the civil society, we have all to be quite united in this. Uh, it's not about if the European Union is good or bad. It's not about if my government is better than the government uh, of uh, my neighbor. It's not about if this political party is being more efficient or less efficient than others in spreading information. It's uh, about something which can harm our civilization, which are harm the way we understand not just politics, but our social life. And we, again, we should be very careful to avoid a situation where at some point 
the virus disappears, but the effect of the virus is there for many, many, many years. This was really a nice uh, message. Uh, in this uh, discussion, we are all all together, I can say. And uh, something positive, can you tell me? Something positive that has come out of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, even in terms, in terms of uh, communications? Well, uh, I don't know if it's in terms of uh, uh, communication. I would say at least two or three things. One, uh, that solidarity among citizens is always there when you need it. And you can see this in all the member states with citizens doing more or less the same things, with uh, citizens accepting the lockdown, with citizens being very solid with neighbors, with citizens helping all the people, with citizens uh, uh, clapping but trying to show solidarity with nurses or with doctors. I think this is also uh, uh, the esprit uh, des communautés uh, the, of, uh, of the European uh, citizens. Uh, second, probably, is the fact that uh, our uh, health system is much better than most of health systems in the world. And we shouldn't forget this. There are countries, there are regions in the world which will be confronted to uh, an even worse situation just because we are unprepared from a medical uh, a point of view. And third, I think that even if this is also uh, maybe something which has been harmed by this information, the fact that being uh, united helps. The fact that having an European Union which can mobilize a lot of money, billions of euros in one, two, three weeks uh, to uh, help the governments uh, to cope with the first financial uh, consequences of the crisis, the economic and the social crisis, this is also good news. In 2008, 2010, when the economic and monetary crisis arrived, uh, the European Union was completely unprepared and uh, the, the reaction was very slow and the results were, for the first two years, I would say, very bad. Now, in a couple of weeks, we have uh, taken uh, uh, more important decisions and mobilized more money than in three, four years uh, after this economic crisis. So this is the positive aspect, if we can say that there is something positive in, in such a, a, a difficult crisis. Now we are yeah. better prepared and we are more solid than we thought we were. We can be better, even better from this. And just the last, just the last question, uh, some fact-checking steps citizens themselves can take to avoid consuming or spreading fake narratives. Do you, do you have some advices for citizens? It's very easy to check. It's just a question of willingness. If you want to check if something that you receive is true or is not, there are many ways to do that. Uh, there are websites, uh, public websites, which help you to identify if this is true or not. You can, of course, also uh, try to identify the source where this is coming from. Uh, you can check also against people around you who are maybe better prepared than yourself uh, to identify this. Uh, you can, of course, and I think that this is probably one of the best ways to do that, uh, to put this into the hands of fact checkers in all the countries. There are fact checkers who are there in the social media through many channels which are able or to check the information, misinformation that you receive, or simply to vehicle, to spread all uh, those misinformation, the, all those cases uh, where uh, they identified uh, misinformation. I myself, I'm a member of some WhatsApp groups, for example, uh, one uh, with uh, 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 people, colleagues who were uh, at school with me. And from time to time, I receive things where I, I don't know if this is true or is not, but the reflex is to, uh, to be quite careful. So you open one of these uh, 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 channels uh, which have been create, created uh, by by these uh, fact checkers and in five minutes you know if this is true or this is not. Thanks a lot uh, really for, for this the discussion uh, and thanks a lot to all the uh, participants. The registration is uh, on our site together.eu. You can follow the European Parliament office in Zagreb on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. Later today you will be able to watch our discussion on our YouTube channel and once more thank you all. It was really pleasant talking with you. Thank you, Damira. Thanks a lot. Um, yes, thank you, Damira, and thank you, uh, Mr. Dukio, uh, for it was great having you today. Um, of course, thanks to all our civil society friends from the Western Balkans who joined us in this discussion, as well as to Faktograph for lending us Mr. Vidov to talk about fighting fake news in this part of the world. 
of course, thank you to Crossol for the partnership today. Um, it was great to have you here and we look forward to seeing you here next week at the same time. Uh, Marco, my colleague, will wrap up now. Thanks. Uh, yes, thank you to all our partners and the speakers. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, and yeah, see you next uh, Thursday at four o'clock. Uh, so this will be our fourth uh, EP Talks. And the next Thursday we have a special session which will be for our ambassador seniors and the school directors, but also our partners from the Croatian counties. Uh, we will have some uh, county mayors uh, with us. Uh, we will send you more information in the upcoming days uh, and see you. Have a nice uh, weekend. Have a nice uh, day of Europe. Uh, follow our uh, social media, follow uh, central social media of the European Parliament, but also solidarnost.hr website because we have prepared many uh, cultural, informative, educational uh, content uh, that you will be able to follow through the, through the whole day on Saturday. Uh, happy Europe's Day and see you next week. Thank you.